Welcome to Mercer Health News. I'm Tracy Watts, and today's topic is the impact of the pandemic on substance use disorder. My guest today is Mary Kay O'Neill. Hi, Mary Kay. Hi, Tracy. Good to see you. Mary Kay is a physician and a behavioral health consultant in our Seattle office. She has worked in just about every aspect of health care, including direct patient care, medical center leadership. She's been the medical director of the Washington State Health Plan for state employees. She's been a chief medical officer at health plans. I could go on and on. Mary Kay, we are thrilled to have you here today. And um, so let's just talk about this. The pandemic has not been just about COVID-19. It's been about managing all of the spillover effects, including the impact on people with addiction and substance use disorders. I was checking out the most recent CDC data on this and could find um, data that indicated over 81,000 drug overdose deaths occurred in the first 12 months ending May 2020. That's the highest number ever recorded. So to get us started, what have you seen with regard to addiction and substance use disorders in employer-sponsored health plans over the past year? Well, it's a very complicated situation and what you might characterize as a perfect storm for people um, who are suffering from the pandemic and all the impacts that has on people's lives, their financial security. Um, there's acceleration in diagnoses of both depression and anxiety, lots of family pressures. And it, with an overlay of what was going on in the United States already with increasing numbers of people addicted to different substances and increasing numbers of overdoses, um, I think things have gotten really tough. Another complicating aspect of this has been the number of people who were in recovery and, re and receiving supportive services. The way those services were traditionally de delivered was in person, in support groups, uh, visits with uh, clinicians and therapists, um, and also programs for things like medication-assisted treatment where they were required to go in on a very regular basis to check on their recovery status and to get refills of their prescriptions. And of course, all of those things kind of blew up at the same time. So what we're seeing is about a 13% increase of people starting or increasing their use of drugs and an 18% increase in overdoses. So from a plan perspective, there are a, a number of things that have been happening, just like the resourcefulness that we've all been asked to bring to the game here uh, about how to deliver services. And so this has really changed things in terms of benefits and service delivery um, uh, models, if you will, uh, to help people through this really tough time. So speaking of benefits and service delivery models, you work with some of our largest and most creative um, clients. What are they doing to try to help their plan members during this pandemic crisis? Well, I think that it's been really hard to focus on this as everyone has been trying to focus on remote working, safe workplaces, testing and you know now the vaccine rollout for for the pandemic but i think there's an increasing awareness that we need to be able to approve in the benefit design and deliver from a network and vendor capability perspective services to people that have this condition and of course um, this this has relied heavily on the telehealth or virtual care models that have come up for other kinds of conditions. So one thing that's happened that's quite different is that people are able to be evaluated for their addiction status over a telehealth type of link. And they're able to get um, prescriptions for say medication assisted treatment, also for um, prescriptions for uh, Narcan to prevent uh, overdose death, you know, in the home setting. So all of those things have been really helpful. And then in the context of, of recovery support, 
many of the recovery uh, support activities such as group settings and peer support has gone to a virtual basis. So there's been a, a lot of innovation and I'm actually quite excited to see how that plays out going forward as we hopefully put this pandemic behind us. Yes, we definitely saw a huge expansion of virtual services. So with all of that in mind, what advice do you have for employers? Well, I think it's really important to look at data, of course, to start with, to look at and see how people's populations are doing, to look at the vendor ecosystem, whether it's through their carrier or behavioral health vendors or other vendors that are emerging in the marketplace to actually very specifically address substance use disorder and make sure that the resources are available easily um, for people who need that kind of help. I also want to put a plug in for some things that are happening out there in the marketplace. One is that there has been an emphasis recently on using a center of excellence concept for treatment programs. We have had a lot of struggle in this country, I think, both of having adequate resources for treatment, but also as concerning to me, having access to high quality treatment programs. And recently the organization Shatterproof, who's a national advocacy organization has published their guidelines for high quality substance use disorder treatment and has started to roll out an atlas indicating which programs across the country meet those standards. So I think that's a very reassuring uh, to people that they're choosing someplace for themselves or for their family members that will really work. And so I encourage employers to be aware of these opportunities that are emerging in the market and make sure that those are very readily available to people when the need arises. That sounds like a great resource. Um, switching gears though, is this also a health policy issue? And if so, what do we need lawmakers and regulators to do to improve on the situation? I like to call um, this pandemic a set of accidental experiments, not the least of which is in the regulatory field. There are a number of things that were passed, you know, in an emergent way to help make sure people could get the care they needed through virtual channels and other things like that. And so we have now this data on how well these different experiments have worked. Some of this has to do with what I described as the service delivery model before. So people were suddenly able to provide uh, like Suboxone or Methadone in multi-day uh, prescription sizes for people to take home. They could be evaluated online, they could be monitored online. And all of these things required regulatory changes. And so we now have a body of knowledge about how well that worked. And I think maybe historically we were fearful that things wouldn't go well in this kind of model. But now I think we have some evidence that they actually may go better because it may work better in people's lives. So I'm hopeful that these kinds of changes will be evaluated carefully to make sure quality is, is maintained, but that you know there's an increased emphasis on access and what works in people's lives to support them as they deal with these issues. So those kinds of regulatory changes are important. And then the other one that has been really problematic in the world of substance use disorder management and treatment has been the information privacy laws that have that cover this particular area at a level that is more intense than HIPAA. And it has made it so even within healthcare systems, people can't always access records to know that somebody is having this kind of issue. And um, and it's made it actually quite dangerous for people because they don't even know what kind of issues that their patient is dealing with. And those have been lightened up during this time as well. And I'm hoping that that will go forward. And, and in part, I am hoping it will go forward in the context of decreased stigma. I think some of the information privacy was to protect people's reputation. And I think with all things behavioral health now, it has become so common that I think it's that people are stopping worrying about stigma as much as they are figuring out how to get the help that people actually need. 
Well, thank you for sharing that. That is super interesting. And as you know, the health policy issues are near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. um, you know, employers pay for the lion's share of healthcare costs for over half of the American people. And so I do think it's important for us to um, raise awareness around these data points and these issues um, to help um, our lawmakers and regulators in Washington. So um, those comments were super helpful. So thank you so much for joining me today and thank everyone for tuning in for this edition of Mercer Health News. Thank you.